son of a gun. In this episode, I'm on the hunt for Nilgai in South Texas. Nilgai, a native antelope to India, have found a home in Texas and in the hearts of Texans, including Texas native Troy Fowler, AKA the Ranch Fairy. <laughs> That's why I like hunting. Nilgai are known for their armor tough hide, making them the perfect animal to test the capabilities of your arrow and broadhead setup. Troy spends an inordinate amount of time thinking about and testing arrows and broadheads for his Ranch Fairy YouTube channel, which is exactly what we're going to do this week if we can get an arrow into a nil guy. Well, you've done a little bit of nil guy hunting. Right. I have not done spot and stalk on them. I did. We hunted fixed stands and and set up on them on water and on dung piles and some trails and stuff. All right, I'll be waiting for your text. Two nil guy day. There you go. <laughs> I, I, like, I like an optimistic hunter. That's right. We'll see you later. See ya. We have a big lake here. We ran into 20 nil guy there and there's a tank 200 yards past it. This is what I know about hunting nil guy. They poop in the same spot, they can't or don't like to jump fences, they're active all day, and they need water. All in all, it ain't much. But we're here for five days, I know there's plenty of them running around, so I figure I just need to put my time in. Right now, I need to pay attention and learn as I go. It's not long before Troy spots his first nil guy to stalk. But we're both learning that for every nil guy you can see, there's probably two or three others close by just waiting to pick you off. It's flat here, and the mountains I'm constantly using like the roll to my advantage. And basically, as I come to a horizon, I'm just peeking over the top. Well, here, there's nothing to hide behind. You know, you always feel like you're exposed. But then I realize you can kind of turn the world sideways, and there's just enough of these like thick little patches of vegetation that if there's an animal on the other side of it, now I'm sort of Instead of using the roll going forward and peeking over it, I'm using these mots and kind of going around the edges. But yeah, it's great, great still hunting conditions, mostly because we got like a solid wind. It's making the vegetation move, so your movement blends into that. And then two, it uh, knocks down the sound. So with the wind blowing in the trees, animals can't hear you walking can't hear, you know, the grass brushing against my boots and my pants. I didn't even see them. Like, I don't think they were up. This is hard. I did not see them. They saw me. Into the brush. 
yardage line, like 10 yards or so. So I'm gonna try to get across this road and get on that trail. And right now she's facing left, so maybe she'll feed and I'll get a shot. It's quickly becoming apparent that we brought our B game to South Texas and that killing a nil guy is going to take our A game. We rendezvous back at ranch headquarters to gather our wits and talk broadheads. So now you do a bunch of work helping out with uh, the Ashby Foundation. And what's like the Ashby Foundation's goal? We're the world's leading authority in studying arrow lethality. Okay. It's not bows, that's not anything. We want to make, we want to figure out what the most lethal arrow system is. As far as Ed's study is concerned, no one's ever given us a comparative analysis and there hasn't been a compound study. So our next 2.0 Ed Ashby is compounds and replicate. You say compound did. bows. Right, he did, a, he did yeah, stick he, bows and I believe he had trouble with compounds early on because you can't measure a pass through. So we know there's some upside to the velocity. Mm. But if, you, if the arrows don't stop, then a four inch difference, which could be 20% gain, right. won't show up in the data. Right, because all you know is it just went out the other side of the animal. Right. Why does the broadhead need to be just like as sharp as you possibly can get it? Because they don't get sharper when they hit something. They either stay static state or they erode. So whatever level of sharpness you can achieve, whether that's a butter knife or something that'll cut tissue paper or newspaper nice and clean that's the starting point but what does it actually do for you does it like help the air is there less resistance when it's cutting through the medium so of an I, animal I actually studied that and yes actually it did you're basically if you think about like a sprinkler system you got a, you got the city pumping 70 goes to a regulator goes to 50 and then the pipes get smaller and smaller then you have a uh, drip system tiny little things yeah that's how your lungs are structured the more of this tiny stuff you can cut, the more damage you're doing at a exponentially microscopic level. And if the blade isn't very thin, then it won't cut the tiny stuff. The, the smaller you can cut, you're, getting, you're, cutting, you're going from hundreds to millions of things damaged. I mean, there's a, it's just unbelievable. A sponge is your best thing visually. Look at a sponge, look at every hole in there, and that's what you need to be cutting at. That's alveoli. If the blade's dull and they're bouncing off because they're tiny, because you know it's it's harder to cut this than paper. If they're bouncing off. I see, off, so they just kind of give they just and give get out of the way. way. It's, very it's, sharp, it's, it's very sharp. It's very sharp. It can't get out of the way. It can't get out of the way. It just touches and it. And it cuts, gets cuts, cut. cuts, cuts, cuts. And you're see. talking exponential millions level right. as opposed to hundreds level. 
So that's where the marginal hit thing, when you throw one and they jump or something stupid happens, they spin and you only get one long. And you kind of cut a slit through there or you cut every single thing that it touches there. Be responsible for your equipment. There's one thing that kills an animal, this. You can, you can look at your bow, you can match your camo. I'm making fun of people here, but you're not being reasonable. Sure. To not pay attention to this thing. It's on you, whatever brand you buy, I don't care, to check them. I just use newspapers. I pick them up every, whenever people throw these readers out. And if I can cut a piece of tissue paper nice, just it picks up pretty quick and just cuts right through it, I'm, I'm good. When you say tissue paper, like I mean, not, not like a Kleenex. Newspaper. And you like the newspaper because it just gives more than just a piece of eight by 11 pretty Yeah, paper. regular paper is pushes back pretty good and it'll give you a little bit of a false reading. Ma oh, makes you feel like a pro. Right. I, I shot a couple of them at deer last year, but I had one left from my deer season that I sharpened myself. Tell me what you think. Okay, well, we'll find out. So this side you had done and that side you had done. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to really quickly pick up and start going, just like that. We bumped a little bit, but that's some of that's the hair on the edge of the paper. So you just want it to go like that and start sliding, no sound. It's perfect, that's great. This is super flimsy and thin, Yeah. right? Remember those arteries I was talking about that are tiny? That's the stuff you need to be able to cut. You did a great job on that. Like you brought this arrow as a pig eye shot, and it's, it won't cut. I shot through a pig, through a shoulder, or through a rib, rib, through a shoulder, and it buried in the mud about a foot. So this one, oh, here it is. Okay, that's the problem. This okay. side. This is very it. common in single bells, and I haven't figured it out yet. Um, it seems like one always comes out duller than the other. And I knew both After sides. After it's gone it. through an animal and, and hit the earth. earth. And I don't know what that is. Maybe it's the first one, maybe it hit first. The earth mm, is what dulls them. Oh, and I think it's because it's homogeneous and it doesn't move. So it's kind of just, they're rotating into that dirt and the dirt just keeps filling on top yeah. and it just sands it down. I mean, everybody knows like the worst thing for an ax or your chainsaw yeah, right. is to, yeah, you know, the, go the through ground. the log and go into the dirt. My broadheads get the ranch ferry stamp of approval and I'm headed out with fresh confidence. Troy is headed back to the water and I'm going right back to where I had action this morning. Troy is stalking almost immediately, but it doesn't take him long to spook it. That's frustrating. She picked me off my sitting still. Let's continue to be busted by no guy. Maybe want to make a mistake. At least three cows. The rest of the day only buttresses my initial fears. 
These Nilgai are way harder to get within bow range than I anticipated. We're hunting a private ranch, but that doesn't seem to be giving us any kind of help other than seeing a fair amount of critters. Taking a casual approach this morning, not being out there, it's coming on 8 a.m. The last two days, the Nilgai movement in the morning has been really slow. And the end of the day yesterday after trying to still hunt all day, making multiple stocks yesterday, I really felt a little exhausted. And not really like physically, but more like mentally, just not in the game. And the last, you know, four or five animal encounters I had at the end of the day just kind of blew them. So I was like X amount of mental capacity. I'm going to save it for prime time, which I figure is going to be from like 10, 11 on through the rest of the day. Day three. We have started to put uh, pieces of the puzzle together. There's a couple of things these things keep doing, which is they're real habitual. They tend to go to the same locations. Even if you spook them out, they come back, which is very strange to us. We know they're, they like water. As you can see, the grass is all dead. So anywhere there's anything green, pretty straightforward hunting anything on the planet. Food really matters a lot. And these guys like water as well. So we found a spot up here that's pretty small. Some of the lakes are really big. They're uncoverable. Some of them are long range rifle across. So those are a little impractical with a bow and arrow, but we've got a spot up here that we've seen them over and over and over. Find nil guy, spook nil guy. Find more nil guy, spook more nil guy. It's comical how many Nilgai we've busted in the last two days. I honestly feel like they're more attentive and spookier than a white-tailed deer. I'm constantly being picked off while standing still. It just doesn't make sense. We try every approach we know. Hunting near dung piles, hunting next to water. I even sat in a blind for an entire day watching a gap in the fence. I saw plenty of critters but no nil guy. All right, my last morning. Temperature changes from the 40s to the 80s. Typical of South Texas, and today it's blowing, which is normal. And we are going to meander into the wind and head to a place where we see a bunch of dung piles in a low spot. It's the last morning. My plan this morning is to sit in the blind for, like I said, 90 minutes, maybe it'll be two hours, depending on if I see some movement around here. And then the winds, the winds switch to the south, so I've got some water holes kind of southeast uh, of me, and I'll probably just go to work with those water holes, still hunting. And uh, I've got until about lunch or one today to hunt we got to pack it up and head home, unfortunately. Alright, it's 8.30. I've been sitting in the blind since about 6 or so. And uh, kind of productive. Had one nil guy cow at probably 60 yards. In retrospect, I feel like I should jump down and try to just put a little sneak on her. But I had some white tails go by. I had a whole pack of javelinas come by, which is cool. But I feel like I think to probably guaranteed myself like at least another stalk or another opportunity on a nil guy. I'm gonna have to go and still on him and find him. The last few days have been relatively static conditions-wise, with little terrain features and just shrubs to hide behind. Getting close to these visually oriented animals has been difficult. But as the breeze picks up and the brush starts to sway, it conceals our movements, hopefully giving us the break we need. Might be some rutting going on. 
and then two small bulls were kind of running out of here and then a <clears throat> I'm looking for the arrow. I thought it passed through, but I, I, I can't find the arrow yet. So it could be in him. I'm gonna search around here a little bit longer and then probably, uh, you know, I ran out so I could see his, the last place I saw him, which was maybe a hundred yards from where he got hit. So I'll walk, walk down there and look for some blood. Roll, baby. Are you rolling? Are you rolling? Yes! No! No! Mmm. Archery is constantly like lows and highs, lows and highs. You've seen it this week. You just get so frustrated because it's not going to happen. And then it happens. And then you don't make like the perfect shot. And you go, no! And then you're just like in the pits, 30 minutes, 45 minutes after you shot. But I said, I said, you know what? He did like stop and hesitate here for just a second. And they turned back into the brush. And I took three more steps and there's a mill guy laying on the ground. I can't believe it happened. That was a tough hunt. I know there's been a lot of critters and a lot of opportunities, but holy shit are these buggers skittish. Skittish. 
How did you get that close to one? <laughs> I mean, that is unbelievable. These things, we were in them all day, just nonstop. We, I ran up into a herd of them, and they were running all around me. It was <laughs> nuts. Uh, I think what did it is uh, they were running. He kind of buggered the cows out of a little patch, and they went one way, and I knew he was going to follow like them. Elk. And so I just like, I ran maybe 10 or 15 yards, and I knew he was going to come around one thing, and I was waiting for him, and he came out, and I'm sitting there, ma, 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 ma. Yeah, right. He doesn't care. Doesn't care, just going away from me. But he was almost going so straight away, I kept looking at my pins, I'm like, I'm not moving my boat. Yeah. Like I wasn't having to lead him, he was just kind of walking enough away and touched off. I think I hit him at like 26 yards. And I thought the arrow was in him, but look, that this I think is falling out of an exit wound, I think. God, what a great animal. Hold on. Is that the entry? Oh, it went through the same side of him. Look at that, unless that's a horn wound, okay? We've, to be oh, discovered. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's what that is. Here's the entry. Yeah, this hole does, well, no, it does. Dude, necropsy. Oh, we're about to go, yeah, full we're, hog on I'm this I'm gonna be dude. in there halfway. With a bull down, but the question of how still up in the air, we go back to the ranch to see what more we can learn performing a necropsy. Feel that, boy. God, it's like a. That's so solid. So here's the here's the entry wound in the stomach. Yeah. Is that the shaft? That's your that, look at it, it's glowing. Yeah. Oh. There's the arrow. Okay, great. The lighted knock. But you know, the arrow could have easily moved back and forth five, six inches while it's been drug out of the woods and transported and all that. Right. But anyways, um, what's amazing to me is like this stomach. I bet you could just put the, hang the stomach and shoot a lot of arrows at it and there'd be a lot of arrows that wouldn't go through it's it. Sol it's a solid mass. Super impressive. <sighs> Woo! Aha! He ran. They snap when, you're, when they run. Hmm. <laughs> so. So we got probably five or six inches of arrow with a broadhead in there somewhere. And the penetration could be even further if it went into him. And it hit his leg and he was running and he snapped it off. And this thing just started, started working. We don't know. That's what's cool about doing this. It's laborious as heck, but man, you learn a bunch. Oh man, I'm so glad I'm gonna start doing, I'm gonna do this with every animal I kill. Even if I hit him with a rifle, cause it's just like so, you learn so much. Maybe five, maybe five inches behind the elbow. Yeah. But if you stay on the crease, then you have you have more ability to shoot where you're not aiming, wind, mm -hmm. you, animal twitches, whatever. But if you're back here and, and you hit there, you're gonna be fine. I'm always thinking because I'm a human, Yeah. I'm shooting at the top of the small You're gonna small hit somewhere paper. in there. Right, because of things in the woods that happen, right? So that's why you go straight up the leg and stay on the crease or a little bit forward. And then you have this giant spot. All of this is really lethal. So one thing that's interesting about lungs, you know, I talked about the diaphragm was flat and the diaphragm was actually a pretty severe V. The back of the lungs is also a severe V. You see this right here, the separation? Lungs are not one piece. They're multiple lobes. So if you hit this, it's lethal, but it's not as lethal as if you pop the front, which deflates the whole thing. So Yanni, well, you couldn't hit that thing more dead center right above the heart. What a beautiful shot. Where is it? Is that it? That's not, we didn't cut that, bud. That's the broadhead. We kind of skinned it. It literally went right between the lungs. That's right crazy. The pulmonary artery, that's what that is. That tube you're feeling, remember I said they're, that arteries are semi-muscular? Yeah. You severed the pulmonary artery and you, sev you severed both airways going to both lungs. Absolutely devastating. I mean, it literally like cut the top of the heart off. Mm -hmm. You cut one of the major arteries this far from the heart. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. You cut the top of the heart off, 
we're not going to split, you know, split hairs here. Pull back on this for me. Yep. Oh, oh boy. Oh, look at that. Hello. Hello, little friend. I am impressed, man. 18 inches of guts, all the vitals, two ribs, kind of half busted one, glanced another one. It went through everything lethal through the whole animal before it stopped. And if that arrow had only gone halfway in, we'd still be out there and sad. You were able to penetrate longer than your arrow length. Get every organ that the broadhead touched. We know they were sharp, right? But you were able to transverse all this or cross across all of this and make sure you got every organ you possibly could have hit. Thank you for playing with me in science class oh, man. here. That was so much fun. I think everybody should be doing this. If, they, if, they, if you're not in a rush and you don't have to like immediately get out of the woods or the mountains because you're going to lose your meter or whatever, you got to get home. Take the time to do some dissection and, and see what your broadhead did or what your bullet did, you know? Right, because I, was, I said this earlier, you start to see a lot of them and then you know the next arrow, the next bullet, you kind of know where to start. Yeah. All right, let's get done cleaning. This is the most inefficient cleaning job I've ever done, but it really, <laughs> we really learned a lot. Thank you very much for playing. Like I said, it's, oh, man. it's fun to hang out with people who want to do this stuff. No, man, I appreciate the work you do. I've learned a lot.